And we are live and on the internet. Hello everyone out there in the wide world of Facebook, YouTube, or wherever you may be watching this. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you. Um, as, we're, uh, as we're doing this, uh, we're doing this live. It's a Friday afternoon, a bit gray uh, today, but it's, it's Friday afternoon. Maybe it's Friday when you're watching this, perhaps in the future. Uh, it's definitely Friday if you're watching with us right now. And thank you everyone for joining us uh, live today. It's uh, always a pleasure to be with you. Uh, my name is John Lustria. I'm the education coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be joined today uh, by one of our board members, uh, Dr. William Campbell. Uh, thanks for joining us. Sure, you're, you're certainly welcome. Glad to be here. Uh, and we're going to be talking uh, today about hospital stewards in the Civil War, a critical linchpin of the healthcare team uh, um, during the Civil War. And we're going to get into all that in just a little bit. I want to give folks time to, uh, to join us. I see we've already got 46 people with us, uh, which is wonderful. A few of you already commenting where you're watching from. Jennifer from Concord, New Hampshire. Alex from... Uh, Huntingtown, Maryland, uh, and I'm sure a host of you from, from elsewhere, Ryan from Colorado, one of our faithful viewers. Um, it's great to see you all tuning in uh, and sounding off in the comments where you're from. Uh, I should note, if you have any questions at any point throughout the presentation, don't hesitate to drop them in the comments. We'll get to them uh, as we go along, uh, as many as we can anyway. We've had a number of videos where we just can't get to everything, but we'll try and get to as many of your questions as we can today. Um, if you like this video or have liked previous videos that we've done, maybe consider hitting the like button on this video or sharing the video. That helps us out immensely um, if you do that. Um, like and share the video helps more people see it and that, uh, that helps us out uh, quite a bit. Um, and I see we've got uh, more and more people tuning in. Uh, Charlena Wilson, uh, teacher with my classroom here from Martinsburg, West Virginia. Excellent. So we got, uh, got some students in with us. That's great. Lynn Bristol uh, from Cantonsville, Maryland. Kathleen from North Carolina. Sherry from White Pine, Tennessee. Alexander Griffith, glad to be able to finally catch one of your program, program, programs. Um, Let's see, uh, Richard from Bridgeport, West Virginia. Uh, John McCarty says, hello from Texas. I've enjoyed your work, Dr. Campbell. Thank you for all your efforts to help uh, others understand medical treatments during the war. So got a, got a fan of yours, Dr. Campbell, in the comments. Uh, Connie and Bob from Virginia, just a, a host of people. We're getting uh, close towards 70 people watching. So that's all very thrilling. Um, so thank you for joining us uh, and you know, the best way you can help the museum for free is to like the video, share the video. If you want to go above and beyond that a little bit, we've been doing a fundraising campaign. Uh, we're trying to raise $25,000 to offset some of the lost revenue um, during the time where the museum's doors had to be closed. We're calling it our Hope Through History campaign. We're trying to bring uh, hope through history, as the, the name suggests, by kind of showing that we've been in tough healthcare related situations in the past. And, you know, we're trying to, to show that history offers some hope if we learn from it. And so uh, we're really close to our goal. We're less than a thousand dollars away from our goal of 25,000. I'm gonna post a, a link for the fundraising campaign in the comments there. Uh, and if you have been enjoying our videos, uh, maybe consider giving. Uh, it helps us here at the museum out immensely. Um, so that would be just wonderful if you could do that. Now, with all that said, uh, let's go ahead and get into our main topic of conversation today. Uh, so Bill, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, to get us started and how you came to be interested in uh, medical history, Civil War medicine and all that. Okay, well, thanks. Um, my, my interest in Civil War medicine started as a child, when my aunt would take me to various different battlefields here in the Mid-Atlantic region, um, I enjoyed it. I certainly you know, found it interesting as a child. But then when I became a registered nurse, I took a whole different look towards the Civil War and I started looking at Civil War medicine. Um, what the nurses were doing, what the hospital stewards were doing, what the surgeons were doing, and that created more of an interest. 
Um, I'm really lucky that I get to tie this in with my classes. I teach nursing at Salisbury University. And I teach the pediatrics course, but I also teach the honors course on nursing history. Uh, so I tie a lot of what I've done with Civil War into both of those classes, especially my history class. So there's certainly a good relationship there. Um, my interest in the, in the hospital stewards in particular actually goes back to my very first major in college. And even though I'm a registered nurse and teach nursing, uh, my first major in college was pharmacy. Um, and I was a pharmacy major at Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science, the uh, first pharmacy school in the nation. Uh, and I spent two and a half years there before I decided that wasn't what I really wanted to do. And I, I transferred over and, and majored in nursing at the University of Delaware and you know, completely changed my career. But that's the first interest that I had in hospital stores was going back to those days at pharmacy school. My second interest in nursing uh, or in hospital stewards and was their relationship to nursing. Because the more I read about hospital stewards, the more I found out how tightly connected they were to nurses. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But certainly that was, a, that was one of the main reasons I started researching hospital stewards to find out what exactly was this relationship that there seemed to be. Um, and then Research has taken many different avenues. I mean, I mean, certainly the first thing I did uh, when I brought my books with me, um, I mean, certainly the first one I looked at was J.J. Woodward. Um, if you're not familiar with that, J.J. Uh, Woodward's Hospital Steward Manual. A classic. Classic, the Bible of the Hospital Steward. Uh, so much information there. Um, what they did, um, what they were wearing, uh, a few words about nursing, I uh, found that really interesting. Um, and actually, I also have uh, Dorothea Dix's copy of the Hospital Stewart Manual as well. Uh, very interesting. She dog-eared the one page, which happened to be the page that they talk about nursing. Well, uh, as, so in that's like her personal, as, as in you have her personal copy that she had during the Civil War? Yes, I do. Very cool. Yeah, she, she signed it many times throughout the book to make sure you knew whose copy that was. <laughs> um, but then going from there, I mean, that was the manual. That was how it was supposed to be. Well, we know things aren't always how they're supposed to be. So then I started looking at first-person primary sources. Because you can read any book, but if you read a book by somebody that somebody has also filtered everything they're saying through their own mind and put their own spin on it. I went back to first person primary sources and said, okay, I want to read those. I want to hear the people that were actually there in the, you know, the 1860s talking about what they were doing. And there are in fact eight books available today, published books that are available that were either written by a hospital steward during the Civil War, so it's basically a printed version of his diary, or someone wrote the book about this person, but they wrote the book using their diary or their letters. So there really are eight primary sources out there for hospital stewards. Uh, and I'm certainly not gonna go into all eight of those and what those guys said, but that has created most of my research on this topic. And, and that's an uh, excellent uh, rule of thumb for all historians, as uh, you know, I'm sure most people watching know, go to the primary sources as much as you can to what the people said at the time. Um, and I'm glad you bring up that point, Bill. It's a great point. I was just last night, actually, talking to one of my kind of non-history friends, and you know, he was saying that how he, for the longest time, he just had this assumption that you know, why didn't people just write about what happened in the past? Shouldn't it be easy? Um, but there, there's so many layers that you have to sift through um, when, when going through that. And I think you made that point uh, really well there. So um, all that said, you've uh, done a lot of work in researching the hospital stewards. Before we get to kind of what it was that they did, how, let's talk about maybe how many there were. Was there some sort of predefined number uh, that would be uh, either with a, a regiment in the field or in a hospital? That is actually a very good question. Uh, and one that is very difficult to answer. Uh, again, um, 
if we go to the manual and what, they, what, what was written by Woodward saying, this is what you should follow. It basically says that for each hospital, there should be one hospital steward. And for each company, there should be one hospital steward. Um, if you read a little bit further and it starts talking about as the size of the hospital increases or the size of the group of men increases. So now we start moving from a company up to a regiment. And interesting enough, it talks about you would increase the number of nurses, you would increase the number of uh, cooks, you would increase the number of laundresses, but the number of hospital stores still stayed at one. Um, I went to a conference, um, actually many years ago, one of the first conferences I ever went to for the museum, and someone at that conference, and I have no idea who it was, but somebody was talking about the hospital stewards, and they said, this person was the workhorse. And I remembered him saying that, but I never really understood that until I started looking at the manual and looking at the um, first person primary sources, and they started talking about what they were doing, and yeah, they were really the workhorses. Now, as the size of the hospital starts increasing, it also says that you can kind of be flexible. So you can add on more hospital stewards as you need to. In one place in the manual, I talk about, well, for a hospital of 500, you might want to have three hospital stewards. Well, once you realize what these men were doing, um, one is not enough for a regiment or a thousand men. Uh, three is definitely not enough for 500 sick patients. You know, this was a huge amount of work. And we have to keep in mind that when we're talking about Civil War hospitals, we're not talking about 20, 30, 40 patients in a farmhouse. We're talking about pavilion hospitals that are built for the Civil War needs. We're now talking about hospitals that hold two, three, four thousand men. And when you start saying how many hospital stores, even if you start increasing it, you know, three per 500 patients, this is still an enormous amount of work for a small number of men. And yes, they were the workhorses of the healthcare system. Yes. Yeah, so, and uh, knowing at least what, what little I know about them, uh, that that's uh, not going to be enough relative to the, uh, you know, the duties that they actually carry out. And, and we should note um, that there are other people there besides the hospital stewards. We've yeah. heavily implied that, but just make that very clear. Um, they are one of, uh, you know, others uh, on the healthcare team, but they're doing a lot of the work. So they're fulfilling slightly different roles, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, both in the field with regiments versus in the hospital behind the lines. Let's maybe break down some of the responsibilities they would be given. Let's start uh, uh, in a hospital behind the lines. Okay. Um, a, ho a hospital story in the hospital. Um, I mean, first of all, there's the very obvious, and I say the obvious, and I was thinking about this earlier today, I'm thinking, well, it's, it's obvious to me, but maybe it's not obvious to everybody, but there is obviously two roles that we think about for the hospital store. One is the pharmacist, and one is the hospital administrator. And when people think about the hospital store, they usually think about one or the other of those roles, when in fact, they were doing both of those roles. So we've got the hospital administrator who is keeping track of all the supplies, ordering the supplies, doing an inventory weekly for some supplies, doing an inventory of everything monthly, um, ordering everything that needs to come in, taking care of all the records. So I mean, certainly the hospital administration part was a huge job, just the paperwork alone was overwhelming. You know, at the same time, this person is also the pharmacist. Um, that term would not have been used in those days. They would have called this person the druggist or the clerk or the chemist. And they, you know, referring to civilian, that would be the apothecary shop, you know, not really the pharmacy or the pharmacist. But this person in today's terms would be the pharmacist. And we think about a pharmacist today, and we think about mainly a retail pharmacist, um, you know, taking tablets, for example, from a bulk size container, uh, putting them into smaller units for 30 days or 10 days for a patient or 90 days, uh, relabeling them and I'm simplifying what the retail pharmacist does because there's certainly all the drug interactions they need to check for, all the allergies, you know, there's a lot more to it, but keeping it as simple as we can for understanding. Today, we think about that pharmacist transferring and relabeling medications. We have to understand in 1860s, 
this pharmacist was making most of those medications. So he was starting with the crude materials. He was grinding them up in the mortar and pestle. He was weighing them out on a balance scale. He was combining them with a binding agent on a tile. He was rolling that out into a worm, basically how a child would roll out Play-Doh into a worm. He'd be laying that uh, worm over top of a pill cutter and then sliding the pill cutter to cut those into individual pills. Then they would have to be coated. Then they would have to dry. And I mean, he would be going through all of these steps just to make one batch of pills. You know, so in addition to all of the hospital administration duties, he's also compounding all the medicines. So every time the surgeon said, I want this man to have this particular medicine, he's compounding that medicine, he's making it. Um, we don't have, or at that time, they did not have the pre-made manufactured medicines that we do today. Now they, that started to come in during the Civil War. Uh, so we had many companies springing up to actually start doing that. And by the end of the war, many of those would be made by companies that are still in existence today because of the Civil War needs. Um, but at the beginning, the pharmacist, the hospital store is making all of these things. He was also an assistant to the surgeons. So he was taking care of the instruments. Um, at the end of the day, he was the person that was wiping off the instruments. He was the person who was sharpening the scalpels. <laughs> Hate to even think about that, but he's sharp, sharp, sharpening everything. Uh, the one thing he's not doing, he's not sterilizing anything um, because sterilization and the need for that really doesn't begin to develop until, the 18, until about 1870. And even then, it's going to take one or two decades for it to really catch on. So, you know, the surgeons of the hospital, the, the surgeons at the time of the Civil War are not sterilizing anything. So that's not part of his job. Um, and as long as that doesn't, you know, as long as that's not enough things to do to keep him busy and out of trouble, there's also another role which most people are not aware of, um, which is one of the things that I found in my research and that is that he was in fact the supervisor to the male nurses. Now we have to keep in mind that nurses in the hospital are two, obviously two genders, male or female. And we all know that Dorothea Dix was the supervisor for the female nurses. And it was actually only those that were paid. There were also many volunteer nurses, which were not under her, but we won't even get into any of that. But there's all those male nurses, and the male nurses far outnumbered the female nurses. So we, we, we often think about, okay, who was the supervisor? And that was one of the things I was trying to find out early on in my research was, who's the supervisor for these? It's not Dorothea Dix, so who is it? And it turns out that, in fact, it's the hospital steward. Now, it was kind of a shared responsibility. The surgeon was also the supervisor of the male nurses but they also had to follow the orders of the hospital steward. So the, the hospital steward is also in this supervisory role of these nurses, as long as he had nothing else to do. <laughs> now that's kind of in the hospital. Now when you get out into the field with the regiments, a little bit different. I mean, he's assisting with sick call. So when the men line up every morning and say, okay, you know, I don't feel good. And the surgeon's trying to figure out what to do with them and what's wrong with them. And the hospital steward is standing right there to hand them the medicine that's needed. And usually it's one of two things. It's either an opium product for their diarrhea or it's a mercury product for their constipation, but he's handing out these medications. Um, he's assisting with first aid. Uh, certainly during battles, after battles, he would be assisting with the first aid. In the field hospitals, he would be helping with those instruments. He would also be compounding the medications at the field hospitals in the field. And the other thing that he's helping out with is the anesthesia. Um, you know, many people think that, oh no, there, there was no anesthesia used during the Civil War and there most certainly was, that is well documented. Uh, we all know about the bite on the bullet idea, which doesn't even make good sense. Not alone was not done. Um, but these men, the majority of them were well anesthetized during their surgeries. And oftentimes it would be the hospital steward helping with that. Now that role of who's actually administering the anesthesia sometimes went to an assistant surgeon if there was one to spare. Sometimes it would be uh, the hospital steward. Sometimes it would be the nurse. Um, and actually one particular nurse, um, 
Catherine Lawrence uh, in her diary talked about administering anesthesia and because her diary was published and she was the first nurse who actually said she was doing that, today she is recognized as the first nurse anesthetist um, because of that documentation. Um, but that was another role that the hospital steward was helping with. Uh, in short, uh, they wear <laughs> many hats. Um, they're, they're Very many. Doing, doing an awful lot. And, and just that further underscores your point about uh, the, the workhorse. You know, they're, they're doing, uh, you know, they're, they're filling in all the gaps, as it were, um, which is a vitally important uh, thing and often a thankless job. Uh, and because, um, you know, because it was something that I think was, uh, you know, th these gaps, if you will, um, I don't think they're as written about as often because they're not as major of a job. Uh, and, you know, we, we have to constantly remember that when we're trying to reconstruct the past, um, you know, we often need to kind of pay attention to the silences. What do we not hear as much about? And I think a lot of the things that you highlighted, you know, who is assisting with the surgery? We know who's performing the surgery, but who's assisting with it? The person's not doing it by themselves. Um, where is all this medicine coming from? I mean, these are all uh, great points and, and uh, I love that you, you bring them to the forefront here. Um, going over to the, uh, or we'll go ahead and chime in Bill, if, if you wanted to there. Oh, I, I, was, I was just gonna say that if, you know, if you're trying to figure out what the hospital steward did, figure out what the surgeon was doing what the male nurse was doing, what the female nurse was doing, what the laundress was doing, um, what the cook was doing, what the wound dresser was doing, and everything else the hospital steward was doing. <laughs> there you go, the, uh, the odd one out as it were. Yes. Um, going over to the uh, comments here, I got, got a few uh, good comments so far. Uh, one from Carolyn Ivanoff, uh, good friend to the museum. She says, hello from Connecticut. Good to see you both Bill and John. It's always nice to have Carolyn tuning into these yes. uh, programs. Um, and I think we can all echo what uh, Charlena says here uh, when she says, good grief. <laughs> um, <laughs> certainly sum, sums it up pretty well. Um, let me see here. Uh, John McCarty says uh, he started out portraying a steward in living history before focusing uh, more on a surgical portrayal. Uh, having assisted other surgeons, I have an immense amount of respect for the men who did it for real. So uh, definitely uh, agree with that. Uh, and an interesting question here from Michael Hardy. Um, in reference to some of the primary sources you consulted. Um, you mentioned that there were eight in particular that you focused on. Um, were they, uh, he asked, you know, he mentions one that, that he has found to be useful. Um, repairing the March of Mars, the Civil War Diaries of John Samuel Anderson, hospital steward in the Stonewall Brigade. Um, and he asks, uh, are there any other good Confederate hospital steward accounts that you know of? That is probably the best one. Mm -hmm. you know, Got it. So, uh, of the of the eight that you referenced before, what, what's the split between Union and Confederate among those? Ooh, uh, I've not counted that up, uh, but gotcha. predominant, predominantly Union. Okay. Got it. Um, Okay, well, okay. Well, good to know that uh, Michael Hardy's onto something there with uh, the Civil War Diaries of John Samuel Apperson. Uh, Bill Campbell approved. Um, Actually, uh, I'm not going to go through listing the eight different ones, but I was going to say there um, was a publication I did for the museum some years ago. If that's still available, it does list out all eight of those. Um, you can probably find them by Googling. Uh, yes, uh, uh, so it is on our website, and I'll post that okay. in the comments uh, uh, in just a little bit here. Great, and uh, there is also a reenactors workshop that normally happens in March. I'm not sure with COVID whether it's going to happen this March or not, but whenever that does happen, the next time I know I am um, on there to be one of the speakers, and in that particular talk, I will be talking about those eight uh, sources and actually summarizing each of the eight separately. Um, so that, that talk will actually focus on those eight. Fantastic. So that as, uh, as Bill mentioned, the, there's an annual historical interpreters workshop. It typically, as you mentioned, happens in March. Uh, we're working um, 
well, not as we speak, but uh, we've there's already been some emails exchanged about nailing down an exact date. It will happen in 2021. Um, so stand by for more details on that. And if you find this interesting, you can uh, check back in when we uh, announce the date for that. Um, we have, uh, it seems, a number of uh, living historians uh, watching in the in the comments. Uh, Alexander Griffith, um, you know, says that you know they uh, portray a hospital steward uh, with the Ninth Pennsylvania Reserves, and they find it very informative. Uh, and I know um, this next question will probably be of particular interest to uh, those folks. Um, but what was the uh, the uniform uh, of a hospital steward? Uh, and I think we, we might have a little show and tell here. <laughs> just, just a little bit. Um, this tends to be a very interesting question because many people are not quite sure of what the uniform is. Um, and even if you look at the CDVs and all the different photographs of the hospital stewards, you will see all types of variations. So when I talk about the uniform, again, I go back to Woodward's Manual of Hospital Stewards because he spells out in a number of pages what the uniform was supposed to be. Um, and there are a number of confusing items um, that need to be clarified by going to Woodward's um, documentation. And one of those is the difference between crimson and red. Um, I guess 10 years ago, uh, I, was a, I was volunteering one summer as a docent. And that was, it was the summer of 2010. I was volunteering at Pry House as a docent. Um, I decided to dress as a hospital steward when I was doing that. Um, I like to dress in the uniform of who I'm speaking about because it's, it just makes it all more real to me. Um, but I found a number of visitors to the Pry House would question my uniform because they would see the color red and they would start thinking, okay, you have something to do with artillery. Because we think about the color coding of the services where it was red for artillery, uh, yellow for cavalry, bl light blue for infantry. And they would see the red and they would be confused by that. And now are actually two different colors. There's red and then there's crimson. Crimson being a darker, more dull, as opposed to the bright red fire engine red. So with the hospital steward, on the pants, there would be a crimson stripe. And the stripe would actually be one and a half inches wide. That did not mean artillery. That meant non-commissioned officer. Anytime you see crimson stripes on pants, it's either, it's non-commissioned officer. If it's an inch and a half, it is a sergeant. If it's a three quarter inch stripe, it is a corporal. So that was the first thing. Um, the second thing was we often think about sashes and sashes are dress uniform, not the worker fatigues, but the dress uniform with a frock coat, you would have a sash. The hospital steward wore a crimson wool sash. So not red because red would mean artillery and it was not silk because silk would mean officer. It had to be crimson wool. Um, so that was two of the differentiations we get into. Um, the uniform, even if it was the frock coat, the dress uniform, it would be a crimson piping and edging, not red. Um, what I'm wearing today happens to be um, the sack coat, so this would be the fatigues or the work jacket, not the dress jacket, the, the frock coat, so there is no edging to it. Um, if the person were in the dress uniform and they had a sword with them, many people think that the sword is the medical staff sword, and it is not. That was reserved for the surgeons. The hospital steward would have the NCO sword, the non-commissioned officer sword, uh, very plain sword compared to the medical staff sword. Um, so again and again, the uniform reinforces the fact that the hospital steward is a sergeant. He is a highest level of the sergeant, so equal to the first sergeant, uh, but he is a sergeant. He is a non-commissioned officer. We see that in the stripe. We see that in the sash. We see it in the sword. But probably the most distinctive thing about the hospital steward's uniform is the chevron. And uh, there you got it. That would be the chevron. And that would be worn on the sleeves, upper sleeve, 
of both sleeves, whether the hospital steward had on his frock coat or his sack coat, either one should have that chevron on there. Uh, and I like to talk about it. I always, it has two snakes intertwined. And I always say they're the smiling snakes because if you look at it closely, they do look like they're smiling at each other. Um, but they always have the chevron with the smiling snakes. Um, there's also documentation I found in research that sometimes the nurses also had that chevron on. But um, Woodward is very specific about that. He says that if it's on the upper arm, it is a hospital steward. If it's on the lower arm, that's a nurse, and that it should only be on one of the arms. And of course, I have found photographs where the nurse had, or the nurse, male nurse, would have chevrons on the lower half of the sleeve on both arms. And then I'm totally confused because I have no idea what that person is because it doesn't fit either of them. Uh, so the chevron is probably the, the most uh, distinctive identification for the hospital steward. And if you look at the CDVs that are out there, many of them, you will see the chevron on the upper sleeve. Uh, we still see CDVs identified as hospital stewards and you look and there's no chevron, but according to Woodward, there should be a chevron on the upper sleeves. And, well, and that's the trick with uh, some of the, the medical uniforms. Uh, sometimes they, they can be a little bit all over the place, but uh, as, you, as you mentioned, the, the chevron's the distinctive feature for, for hospital stewards. And just a, a bit about the, uh, the smiling snakes as you, you put them, they also feature pretty prominently on the, the museum's logo as well. So if you want a, a good up and close look at those, you can, you can look, uh, look at them on our logo. Um, and, and even the chevrons, um, because some of the chevrons were mass produced in factories, but some of the chevrons were tailored, you know, by the wives back home or by the, you know, the family members back home. So even within the chevrons, you will find variations in color and design. You know, they've still got the, the smiling snakes, but they will have a little bit variation there as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I also um, just posted in the comments uh, the article that uh, Dr. Campbell wrote for the museum uh, a few years ago with the, kind of highlighting the primary sources that he consulted. So for Michael, who asked that question earlier, you might consult that. You might, uh, that might be of some, some use to you there. Um, now, Bill, you touched on this uh, briefly uh, um, beforehand, but Lynn Bristol asked a question um, do, did hospital stewards qualify for pensions and what was their basic compensation? I know you mentioned that they were, you know, pretty much equivalent in rank to a sergeant. So, I mean, presumably they would get paid along those lines as well. And that one I cannot pull off the top of my mind. Uh, I mean, I know it was greater than what the normal um, enlisted man was making. It was no place near what the surgeon was making. But the exact amount, I do not remember. It has been many years since I ran into that particular number. And uh, and what about pensions? I mean, I, I expect they probably would receive them yes. as you know doing service for the, the federal government, right? Yes, they 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 were eligible for pensions. Gotcha. Um, let me see here. Okay, so you know we we've talked you know in, in pretty large abstract terms about you know the role of the hospital steward. Uh, do you want to highlight any individual stories uh, or anything along those lines for you know want to get specific a little bit here? Sure, I can I can talk about some specific ones, and I am not going to talk about the eight uh, that are out there published uh, because I don't want to spoil the books or spoil my later talk. Um, but I, I went looking to find some other specific ones uh, other than those eight that I have run across in the past. <coughs> Excuse me, so I am gonna talk about them. Um, first one was hospital steward was MB Summer, and he was in the 13th South Carolina Infantry. Um, he was at Gettysburg, and he was a hospital steward at the Samuel Lohr Farm Field Hospital and was captured there on July 5th. So he would have been there during the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, on the 4th, as the Confederate troops are withdrawing, he would have stayed behind to take care of the wounded, uh, which what has happened with many of the healthcare workers, they would stay behind with the wounded. And at that point, he was captured on the 5th of July. 
He was sent to Fort Delaware as a POW. And two months later, he died there. Um, and when we talk about all of the deaths at Fort Delaware, and I've done a lot of work on Fort Delaware and the diseases there, and the majority of those men, those prisoners who died, those were deaths related to disease. And we, we often talk about you know, the two to one ratio of disease to wounds, but we're talking about overall, um, certainly the deaths by wounds would increase during a battle. And if we're talking about a prisoner of war camp where there's no fighting going on and there's very few uh, shootings other than escapes, um, we find that most of the men there are dying of disease. Um, so two months later, he dies of disease. He's buried at Finns Point at Fort Mott, New Jersey. Uh, none of the prisoners, Fort Delaware had a, close to 13,000 prisoners there on that island at one time um, after Gettysburg. Um, but because of the low water table, they could not bury anyone who passed away at the fort on the island. They would have to be shipped across Delaware River to New Jersey and buried at Finns Point. So he is buried there. He is noted on the monument there. Um, it's not easy to find, but Finns Point is a huge cemetery. It does have two monuments, one to the Confederate troops who were buried there and one to the Union troops buried there. And he is noted on the monument and identified as a hospital steward. Um, the real question was, okay, he died of disease. What disease did he die of? And that is not recorded uh, for, the, for the prisoners or for most of them. In his case, it's not recorded. Um, but simply looking at the date that he died, September 13th, 1863, um, there was a prisoner of war, not a prisoner of war, a, pris a political prisoner there at that time, Reverend Handy. And Reverend Handy was there for quite a number of months. And during that time, he kept a very detailed diary of what was happening at Fort Delaware. And because he was a political prisoner, he was free to walk around the island, unlike the Confederate soldiers who had to stay in the pen. But he would walk around the island. And one of the things he would do would he'd make a pass every day by the wharf and count how many coffins were sitting on the wharf that were being shipped later that day to New Jersey to be buried. And he said on that particular day, there were 12 coffins on the wharf waiting to make the um, journey across the water. He would also talk to people as he went around on his rounds, and he would often talk to the healthcare workers. And on that day, he talked to one and found out that almost all of the coffins, the deceased had died of smallpox. So we can make the assumption, not fact, but assumption, that he probably died of smallpox. Um, and, and certainly being a prisoner of war, um, not getting the nutrition that he needed, drinking the contaminated water that he was all the time, uh, certainly in a low state of health and wellness himself, it would have been very easy for a de deadly disease like smallpox to overcome him. Um, not just the Confederates though. I mean, we have to look at, there was also a Union hospital steward, also at Fort Delaware, a little bit later, a few months later, uh, by the name of R.C. Underwood, and he was regular U.S. Army, so he was one of the guards at Fort Delaware, and in this case, because he's a hospital steward, he'd be working in the post hospital, and there were two hospitals on the island. One was the post hospital, and one was the contagion hospital, um, and he's working there, and on January 3rd, 1864, he dies, and it is recorded that he died of smallpox. So we know that for the healthcare workers, that was a big killer uh, for those guys, uh, whether they were Confederate or Union. But this is the case of two hospital stores, opposing sides, both on the same island, the same fort, same period of time, within a few months of each other, both of them passing away from smallpox that they probably picked up taking care of patients. Um, so even being a hospital steward was not 100% safe. I mean, it may have got you out of the line of direct fire, and saved you from the bullets, but you still had to deal with all the diseases. Um, there was another hospital steward, uh, this one by the name of Charles Beale. And Charles Beale was at Dunbarton Street Hospital in Georgetown, right outside of Washington, DC. 
He was an acting assistant surgeon. So an acting assistant surgeon would be a contract surgeon. Uh, so not military. He's been employed to work for a period of time by the federal government. And he, in this case, he was working as an assistant surgeon at Dunbarton Hospital. And on January 1st, 1863, he's writing a letter to his father talking about he's going to apply to be a hospital steward. So he has gotten you know, used to the hospital as this contract surgeon, and he's identified this job as a hospital steward. He's saying, that's what I would really like to be. And in the letter to his father, he talks about how he hopes he gets this job because it is so difficult to get a job as a hospital steward. Um, he said he had to have three references. They all had to be from surgeons talking about his skill as a medical worker. Um, that he would have to go through interviews, he would have to go through an application process. And if he was successful on all of this, um, and especially taking that exam, which was an oral exam, if he was successful at all of this, he would be appointed as a hospital steward. And that that appointment had to be okayed by the Secretary of War. Um, so he was saying this would be a really great job because in this position, once you are appointed as a hospital steward, you cannot be pulled back to being a soldier. You cannot be pulled back to the ranks to be in a fighting position. You were a hospital steward for the rest of the war. You were pretty much safe from the bullets, not safe from the diseases as we already saw, but you're safe from the bullets. Um, the other interesting thing there to keep in mind is that he is appointed. So he goes through this whole competitive process to get this position to be okayed, approved, he's appointed, he's got this position for the rest of the war. If we contrast that to nurses, nurses were detailed, they were not appointed. So it might be somebody walking down the line of men one day and saying, okay, we need a nurse in the hospital and I go, oh, how about you? You do it today. You know, no consideration of experience no education involved. It's just you're, you're the nurse for the day. Um, so that would be one way they're detailed. We also see convalescent soldiers, uh, men who have been wounded or sick and are trying to recover and get over it. So basically their physical therapy would be working as a nurse. <laughs> That's one way of looking at it. Uh, you want to keep them active? Okay, let's make them a nurse. That'll get them active. Uh, and also invalids. So someone who had an injury and they could not recover from that injury to be back to 100% to be on the front lines fighting as a soldier, they would be a convalescent and they might be a convalescent nurse. Uh, so we see nurses being detailed all the time, which implied no experience and no education. Uh, whereas the hospital steward, we're going through this whole selection process. And one of the things that the selection committee is looking at is what did this guy do before the war? Uh, if he was a medical student, if he was a clerk in an apothecary shop, if he worked as a druggist or a chemist, then that made him much more likely to get this position as a hospital steward. So we really did see some degree of education, apprenticeship, experience being important in the hospital stewards um, selection process, whereas in nursing, uh, that did not happen. Yeah, a few great points that uh, to to take out of those those uh, stories that you share with us, which are all pretty compelling in their own in their own way. Um, number one, you, you mentioned the hospital steward uh, would often act in like a supervisory role, uh, and that I think difference in experience level, education level, selection, you know, criteria, I think probably uh, played a pretty large role in in how that was determined in the hierarchy. Um, and then uh, next, I mean, it's, it's an obvious point, but it, it doesn't get talked about nearly enough. I mean, the role of uh, any medical personnel in the Civil War is incredibly dangerous, not so much from, from the bullets, although that does happen from time to time. Um, but, you know, the, and it's, it's so hard to get a, a feel for because these deaths from disease are not, you know, instantaneous. I mean, they you know, the death ultimately comes, you know, days or weeks, you know, after the, the event of contagion. So it's hard to kind of 
to kind of put some firm numbers to some of these sort of things. But that's a, an incredibly uh, illustrative story about those two stewards, uh, both on, on the same island, um, dying likely uh, of the same disease. So, um, you know, uh, um, can't can't be thankful enough for the uh, the frontline healthcare workers, both then and certainly now. Um, these days in the midst of a pandemic. So that's, uh, that's a, a, a great story. I love that you brought that. I mean, there, there, was, there was a danger to being a healthcare worker. I mean, we, we often say, okay, if the person's a surgeon or if the person's a, <clears throat> a hospital steward, they're, not, they're a non-combatant. You, you're not supposed to shoot them. You know, they're not carrying a gun, they're not firing, so you're not supposed to shoot or try to kill them. Um, and they're gonna take care of people on both sides, but, you know, we can put the chevron on the arm, we can put the colored sash on the person, we can put a special sword on the person to let people know not to shoot in their direction. But the bottom line is if a bullet is coming in a straight line or if a cannonball is coming in a straight line, it doesn't matter what sword you carry, what chevron's on your sleeve, what sash is around your waist, that bullet or that cannonball is not gonna deviate just because you have symbols of non-combatant on you you're still going to be hit and mm -hmm. healthcare workers were. That's right. Um, going over to the comments here, uh, we have uh, uh, Victoria in the comments who says that uh, Dr. Apperson is her great, great grandfather and uh, his diary is wonderful and she grew up reading it. So that's, that's very cool to, that we can that's, connect the, these dots in the comments. Um, and just quickly, um, I meant to say this earlier, if you happen to miss something earlier, if you joined late, I saw someone say they joined a little bit late, uh, this will continue to exist on our Facebook page. So you can go back and watch this whole program from the beginning. Uh, if you wanna catch something that way you can pause, rewind, you know, really dive into you know, what it is and take all the notes, all the notes you, uh, you need or want. Uh, Charlena Wilson asks, how were uh, injuries triaged, rank or severity? Uh, and uh, I think you'll echo me on this, Dr. Campbell, uh, severity um, was the, the main factor there. Yeah, uh, and they, and uh, uh, focusing uh, in, in different you know, than today, focusing on the limb injuries as opposed to the, the head and chest injuries because you know, they could do the most to help those with the limb injuries. Today, they would prioritize the head and chest uh, mm -hmm. injuries. Let me see here. Um, John McCarty uh, asks, Dr. Campbell, can you comment on the use of white linen or wool overcoats, what we would consider a lab coat today? I've seen varying accounts of their use and it seemed to be a contentious thing among other surgeons, stewards I worked with. It's my understanding that they weren't issued. Is, is that correct? Yeah, as far as I know, and, and certainly according to Woodward, they, the linen was not issued. Um, and based on the fact that they are a non-commissioned officer, their uniforms normally are going to be su supplied by the military, not tailored by their home tailor back home in their village. Um, so the uniform should be fairly true to what's written in the manual. Um, I also have seen the, the linen overcoats or lab coats, um, not that often, but I know they did exist and some people did wear those. Um, but, but according to Woodward, uh, for fatigues, work purposes, it should be the wool sack coat. Gotcha. Uh, and some helpful information in the comments here from Alexander Griffith in reference to how much a hospital steward was paid uh, and he's getting this from Woodward. Uh, he says they were paid uh, originally $22 a month uh, and which uh, eventually got increased in April of 1862 to $30 a month. So there we go. We finally, finally got uh, the answer to, to that question. Uh, now I saw um, Martin, uh, Martin Quinn asked this question early, earlier. He asked if uh, you know, he was late and missed it. Uh, you have not. He asked if there was uh, some sort of equivalent to the hospital steward in the modern healthcare system. And now is a great time for that question. So uh, what would you say uh, about that, Bill? I think there are actually many parallels in the modern healthcare system. However, they are split up. Uh, we mentioned about the hospital steward of the Civil War being the workhorse and how many different roles he was 
fulfilling how many different hats he was wearing. So we can find parallels today. However, the parallels would be branching out into multiple different people. Um, so certainly the pharmacist would be one and not so much the retail pharmacist, but if you look in the hospital and you're looking at the clinical pharmacists or the PharmDs, um, those are very parallel to the hospital steward if you break off just the medication part. Uh, the hospital steward compounding the drugs and dispensing the drugs today would be that particular person. So that's one parallel as the pharmacist. Um, I'm not even going to get into hospital administration because that would be another job of the hospital steward. And today that would be many, many different people in many different departments within the hospital trying to do that one job that this one guy did. Uh, so we don't even want to touch on that one. Um, the other one, though, that I did not really realize the parallel until I started reading the eight different sources. Um, and when I started reading the eight primary sources and I started looking at the men saying what they were actually doing on a daily basis, I realized that we do, in fact, have a position today very, very similar to the hospital steward and at least what those guys were doing, and that is actually the nurse practitioner. Uh, nurse practitioner are very, very similar, same type of job, uh, the physician's assistant, the PA. Um, if you look at the primary sources, many of these guys were um, doing minor surgery, they were suturing, they were uh, diagnosing and dispensing if the surgeon wasn't available or had been killed or was sick, they would jump in and fill the role of the surgeon. So they were diagnosing diseases. Uh, they were prescribing medications and then they would compound the medication themselves. Um, but they were working with a great amount of autonomy, um, you know, very independent, especially if something had happened to the surgeon. And when you compare it, okay, that is very similar to the nurse practitioner today. Um, I mean, some of these guys were even going out into the community. They would be in camp with the soldiers, but then when they finished taking care of the soldiers, they would move into the community and they would take care of civilians in the surrounding community and they would be diagnosing and prescribing. I mean, basically that is a nurse practitioner, you know? Um, and then if we think about them administering anesthesia during surgery and assisting the surgeon, well, that's the role of a certified registered nurse anesthetist you know, the CRNA that we have today. Uh, so there are actually a number of parallels there. Uh, but again, you've got to branch out and look for the different parallels based on the actual job that they're doing. And it's uh, quite remarkable to think that, you know, all of this was uh, done by, you know, a, a single individual. Um, so, and, and there's probably a lot of wisdom these days since they're breaking that responsibility up amongst, uh, you know, many different, uh, different uh, people. So um, that's pretty remarkable when, when you look at it. Um, interesting question here from the comments um, uh, from Gary asks, uh, were all hospital stewards men? Yes, as far as I know, as far as I can find, um, because they came through the military, because they were through the military selection process, because they had to be appointed, uh, then they would all be men. I have never found anything about a female masquerading as a male and then that male ending up as a hospital steward. Uh, I've never run across that particular one. So as far as I know, all of the hospital stewards would have been men. Gotcha. And, and of course, the beauty of being a historian is you never know what you're going to turn up next. But, uh, right. but yes, that, that, that matches up with uh, what I know as well. Uh, all men, um, but one never knows. Um, uh, well, as we're uh, drawing to a close here, um, this has been a, a delightful time. Uh, I wanted to give you a, a final word, Bill. I mean, I know you work with a lot of uh, nursing students and, uh, you know, nursing is a passion of yours. Uh, any kind of, well, I guess you got into the nurse practitioner, but if there, any, anything further you wanted to say about hospital stewards relating to nursing and, uh, and all that? I, I think the, probably the, Biggest finding of all of this for me as a nurse 
was the fact that the hospital steward was the supervisor of the male nurses. Um, that had always been a question kind of lagging out or kind of piquing my interest all the time, trying to figure out who was really supervising these male nurses. If there were so many of these male nurses, far outnumbering the female nurses, that they did not have experience, they did not have education, but yet they were expected to do this job. I mean, who was the supervisor that was trying to keep an eye on these guys all the time? And then to find out that it was the hospital steward, uh, that that was really the main super person of supervision. I mean, other than the surgeon is involved as well. Um, but you know, that answered the question, okay, if, 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 um, if you think about Dorothea Dix, being the supervisor of the female nurses and you're saying, okay, who's, in fact, at one point I actually wrote an article on who's the father of nursing in the United States. We always think about, you know, the importance of Dorothea Dix, the importance of Clara Barton. Uh, you know, we think of Florence Nightingale, although she was not in the United States, but certainly a big influence in, in the U.S. Who is the father of nursing? Um, and, and I think if there's an answer that we can really put forward, it, it's got to be the hospital steward. I mean, even though it's not an individual person, it's a role. Um, but that was the, the father of nursing in the U.S., and that was the supervisor of these male nurses. Um, one of the uh, points that I often make with my students is the importance of collaboration. Um, you know, that the various different people in the various different roles of healthcare have got to talk to each other and work together. Um, when we think about the hospital steward, I mean, he was working with the male nurses, female nurses, and the surgeons. They, you know, he didn't have many people to collaborate with. You know, but today, that one role of the hospital steward has been exploded into many, many different people. And it becomes much more important and much more difficult for all of those people to interact and to talk and to communicate and to coordinate their care for that patient, whether it is a Civil War soldier or whether it's a patient today, you've got to have that collaboration. And while it was easy for the hospital steward because it was one person doing most of the work, it's a much, much bigger challenge today, but we're still back to the nurses, the pharmacists, you know, and all the, and the surgeons and all these other people have got to talk and work together. You can't each one operate in your own little silo. And that's a, a great point to end on uh, the importance of cooperation. Um, it's more important now, it seems, today than ever. So um, great, great point. Uh, well, this has been wonderful, Bill. I, I know I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. I think the people watching along have enjoyed. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. You're, you're certainly welcome, and I, I thank you for the invitation to speak and to talk with you. Yeah, and, and thank you to all of you watching out there with us. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been wonderful reading your comments. Uh, a lot of questions uh, and comments. Didn't have time to read, read them all, get to them all. Um, so thank you for that. Um, if you haven't already, please like and share the video. It helps us out quite a bit. Uh, and I know uh, a number of you have uh, uh, donated to our fundraising campaign while we were going here. Again, the link for that is in the comments our Hope Through History campaign. We're, we're under $1,000 um, to get to our goal. So if you haven't yet donated, now's the perfect time. Uh, if you've enjoyed this or any of our other video programs, thank you for those of you who have given. Uh, we really appreciate it here at the museum and you're going uh, a long way to putting us in a great position to continue sharing the message of Hope Through History. Uh, through 2021 and well beyond. So um, thank you so much for uh, everyone who's given and thank you so much for everyone who's uh, watched. Uh, we'll be back, uh, well, Bill and I won't be, but uh, Jake will be back with you all on Monday, January 11, I think it is, talking about the, uh, the career of John Brinton, one of the most unique uh, Civil War surgeons. Um, so that promises to be a great program. I can't, uh, can't recommend that enough. So um, we'll see you next on Monday. Uh, until then, this is John and Bill signing off.